Fran. How are you? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Hi, yeah, well, everything's fine. Thank you. Just uh, enjoying the beautiful weather in the UK at the moment. I'm so glad you and I are having this chat because I've been reading up about you and I think you've got a most amazing story to tell, which I'm not going to tell. But first and foremost, you are a, a tennis player. Te give us a bit of your, your background because you're from Yorkshire, that's right? Yeah, yeah. So um, I was born in um, Keithley, which is just outside Leeds. Um, and yeah, I've been playing tennis since I was about five or six years old, um, give or take. My parents and I always have a little discussion about that because I think I was six, but my mum thinks it was five. Um, and yeah, um, I, I moved to Barcelona when I was about, I think, uh, just before I turned 10. Um, I've been living there for, well, full time really since I moved there. Although I currently find myself back in uh, Surrey living with my parents during this, uh, this lockdown. How's your Spanish? Uh, yeah, um, well, Spanish is basically my first language now, because um, I obviously when you move there at such a young age, uh, I think it makes it easier. I think it's scientifically proven that it's easier to learn a language from a younger age. And um, what what I did was my coaches, although they spoke perfect English, I just asked them to speak to me in Spanish all the time. And actually, the the, the family that I've I've lived with since I've been out there in in Spain, and they don't speak one word of English. Um, so that kind of uh, was, there was only one choice really which was to learn the language. And what made you decide to go to Spain because you're training in the same place that Rafael Nadal and Andy Murray played at as well is that right? Um, no so I was training there I've been there I was there until 2016 mm -hmm. um, and well the reason for moving there was uh, when I decided I wanted to become um, more than just um, you know your standard player or as playing as a hobby I, I wanted to take it further and become a professional um, I, I, th I felt like I needed to make the right choice for, for my career and you know still to this date you don't really have the same options in the UK as you do in Spain or the US and those are the two countries that are really renowned for their tennis academies and um, well my parents and I decided alongside my coach who was who was with me at Heat and Tennis Club when I first started tennis um, he he also you know voiced his concern for my options up north and, and he had just come back from doing some courses in Spain some coaches courses and he he was very um very honest with us about the fact that he didn't feel he would be able to take me very far and um, so yeah so we explored our options and I ended up settling down in Barcelona. Of all the conversations that I've had with tennis players over the last few weeks, they've either gone to the US or in your case have gone to Spain. I find that truly fascinating. I mean, why did you decide to go to Spain first and foremost and how much was a, of that was a transition for you? Well, I think Spain was the easier option over the US, um, just obviously distance wise uh, for my parents to still be able to come over and check in with me and um, uh, I, I personally prefer the, the way that tennis is taught on a clay court so um, I felt that it would be, you know, better for, for my game to be to be taught in Spain um, at the time I think um, you know I hadn't really had much exposure to the US um, as, as, as a kid I, I'd never actually been I think before I was nine so um, I, whereas I was familiar with the with with Spain I'd, I'd been multiple times to Marbella and, and the South Spain holiday and, and also to the Canary Islands etc so I think I felt more comfortable there over the US um, and I guess in terms of you know, being a transition. Yeah, I mean, when you are at such a young age, it's you are more adaptable. So, um, I think to a certain to a certain extent, yes, you miss your friends and, and, and you miss your home. But because you're a kid and you're constantly doing new things and trying new things, I think when you're put in a position of of a, a new lifestyle, you actually adapt quicker than people expect. So yes, it was a transition. I mean, obviously, you know, going from Yorkshire to Barcelona is is, is that's to that's a a different end of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah. 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 but um, but yeah, I, I mean, I I thoroughly enjoy it, and I do not regret it for one second. So just to clarify, how old were you when you went over to Spain? So I, I first started trying academies when I was about eight, and um, so I, I tried different ones around around Spain. Um, and the actual move we made in, I think, start of summer 20, 2010. Um, so my parents bought a house out there 
and um, we moved in in 2010 and um, yeah and, and I kick-started my school term and my training there and pretty soon after. So picks up a racket around about the age of five or six depending which parent I'd be talking to to clarify exactly. that. Yeah exactly. Then made the decision to go and, and train in Spain but there's one <laughs> other thing about you as well you were born with a rare genetic disorder tell me a little bit about that. Yeah so I was born with um, EEC syndrome. Uh, it's electrodermal dyspulsia I think it's a very long word so Something I always like prefer anyway. to yeah. I prefer to use the abbreviation um, <laughs> And yeah, I was I was born with that, and obviously faced some um, some challenges from a very young age, and 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 that was the reason why I I, I truly decided to um, pick up a tennis racket with some you know uh, conviction, let's say, um, because I was never really interested in sport, um, and and if I were interested in sport, I'd always choose football over tennis. So, so um, I I felt you know that there was. My, well, my coaches when I originally started because I, I, I picked up a tennis racket because my dad wanted to get rid of myself and my brother and sister for the summer whilst he was working so he just threw us in a in a summer camp and that was the way I picked up a tennis racket and the um, the coaches that were, were supervising the camp at the time said that I was I was doing all right and and I was a very chubby kid who you know maybe liked the odd too much Cadbury's um, and so it was just kind of a way to keep me you know active and, and, and my parents and I then had to obviously speak to my doctors at the time about you know the prospect of of, of sport in general and then um, what I would and wouldn't be able to do and and that right there is you know where the where the um, passion and the ambition kind of grew because I didn't really like people telling me what I wouldn't be able to do and uh, tennis was one of them so uh, I, me being me I didn't really listen to the advice and, and wanted to prove other people other uh, I wanted to prove people otherwise. As I said, when I was doing my prep about your your journey so far, the one thread that kid that was going through was that the word determination kept popping into my mind. You were determined to become a racket. You were determined to go to Spain. You're determined to to live your life as as normal people do, going about their business and doing something that you love. And you talk about conviction and I know the word impossible doesn't even feature in your vocabulary. But though how frustrating is it that people as you, you know, as more your profile grows, will it become frustrating that people always refer to you as somebody that has a particular syndrome, or is it that you prefer people to know you just as a tennis player who loves being out on court? Listen, I think there's always going to be a part of that that is going to follow me around in my career. Um, you know, there's there's no hiding that, and I wouldn't want to hide it anyway because it's something that it defines. It doesn't d define who I am, but it it, it defines my career in terms of the reason why I started um, and whether the reason I started was uh, you, you know my syndrome or uh, my parents or uh, you know a tennis player that inspired me that is a defining moment in your career what what, what instigates that that um, that passion so I think yeah I mean I I'm obviously I, w I would like to be an advocate for, for people that maybe feel you know that they're not good enough or that they feel that what they have is a disadvantage when actually you can use that to an advantage and that's why if there's one thing that I will always always um, state very clearly is that I do not want my syndrome to be referred to as a disadvantage because in fact I think it's what can separate me from many of the other people on the tour Um so yeah I mean at the end of the day I do want to be a tennis player and I have my goals within the sport um, but you know I, I, I do this for a reason and, and I, I have absolutely no issues with people um, referring to me as you know maybe the player with the syndrome as long as it is with the best intentions and with the best um, the best perspective and the perspective I intend people to have. What are your goals Fran? Um, very quite quite a hefty goal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to be lifting that trophy at Wimbledon, and um, but you know, on a wider basis, um, I do want to be playing consistently at the top of the game. I, I don't want to float in and out, and um, I, I want to be be there and, and be a figure that people, you know, do look up to and do um, do want to uh, you know follow in, in in their track. So, I think for me, you know, if anything, it's really establishing myself in in the game and the, in the history of the game 
And in terms of your training, now that you're, you came back to the UK when the lockdown was instigated around the mm -hmm. world, how are you managing your training? Because the one thing the syndrome affects is your hands and your balance. Yeah. So, um, I mean, firstly, I thank you. Well, I'm not sure whether I can say thankfully or not, but I was sent home from a tournament. Um, but they sent us home a few days earlier to, than the actual lockdown um, was put in place in, in the UK. So it gave me about three to four days. Um, and all I was bothered about was getting to a gym shop, a shop that had some stock um, and, you know, literally just got everything I felt like I, I, I needed without, you know, without going too far. Um, so I, I managed to get my hands on some bars, uh, well, an Olympic bar, some plates and um, you know, some dumbbells and, and, and kettlebells, etc. So for me, this actually this period has been quite a, a beneficial training block because um, there's no... There's, you know, I can't hide behind the fact that I am physically behind um, quite a few people because I was limited from a very young age at what I, I could do um, and lifting weights was one of those limitations. So I've only really been lifting weights properly for about a year and a half and, and that, that is very late in, in a career to start. Um, so for me, right now, I'm taking advantage of that time that I couldn't, I couldn't use to my benefit previously and, and, and I'm really trying to um, build a good physical base during this period. So I'm, I'm doing... Two, two physical sessions a day and um, probably training about three to three and a half hours and, and obviously on Friday last week was it Friday yeah uh, we were given permission as uh, thank I, I mean great I'm very grateful for the fact that I'm part of the PSP program and um, that the LCA has established and then um, I have access to the NTC from this week onwards and um, so that obviously gives me the option to be on court as well. You mentioned about the, the PSP programme, which I used to say to people is the Lawn Tennis Association Pro Scholarship Programme. When mm -hmm. you found out that you were going to be included on that list, what was your first reaction? Obviously, look, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm very patriotic. So anything that is, you know, British tennis um, related, I, um, I always feel proud to be part of. I think um, you know, my, my relationship with the LTA previously hadn't necessarily been the best one or let's say it hadn't been the one, um, a consistent one because I was overseas and, and, and didn't really have much contact. But um, as I grew into the, the juniors and the under 18s, um, they did start to, you know, take me under their wing. And then um, I think the biggest benefit, apart from the obvious, you know, financial um, benefits that, they, that you do receive as part of the PSP, for me, what what I actually appreciate the most is the medical attention that I receive um, because I know how vital that is for someone in my position and um, uh, the physios at the, the NPC are second to none and I, I really have just managed to use them to my benefit and, uh, and enjoy the work that I've done with them and um, you know the, the doctor Jo Larkin as well, she's top notch so um, anyone in that medical team that has helped me I, I owe a lot to and, and and that is really what the PSP um, programme has provided me with and something I'm very thankful for. The PSP programme, for those again who don't know, is, the, is funding for British players who the governing body will believe will crack the top 100, which is like the gold standard in this country for tennis. That must give you just such confidence that the governing body believe that you're one of those players who could do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm... I've been very, very lucky to have um, the support I've had and, and, and yeah, okay, maybe I've earned it, maybe some people might say I haven't, but I um, I think that the relationship I've had with the, the LCA in the last few years has, has allowed me to, to reach new levels and to discover, um, you know, maybe discover and identify some sides of, of my game that can, can be improved that I maybe myself hadn't, hadn't thought of um, and, and I think that that obviously is invaluable information. Um, I think for me, uh, in terms of the confidence, I mean, I, I am, as, as you've mentioned, I'm very determined to, to reach a certain level in, in the sport. And um, I wouldn't like to say that I'm dependent upon other people for, for that, um, you know, that extra little bit of motivation or that extra little bit of, um, of a push. Because um, I'd say one of the very few compliments I give myself is is just that I am quite self driven. So um, that that side of things is is doesn't have as much of an effect on me. But in terms of the you know the benefits that I've received and, and just mentioned and the um, 
the people that I've managed to work alongside within the LTA who have provided me with, you know, a really good helping hand. Um, that is, is, is what, you know, helps me um, keep improving. You talk about one of your goals is to, to lift that trophy at Wimbledon. What special memories do you have from playing at that tournament? You know what, my memories, I wouldn't really say come from playing there. I think they come from um, visiting as a child. I think the, the impression that that club and that tournament and the championships leave on you at such a young age is, I, there's no word to describe it, it's, just, it's pretty astonishing. Um, my, my, my dad and I used to visit every, every summer um, when, from the age of about, well, as soon as I started tennis, so from the age of maybe five, um, we visited for about five consecutive summers and um, I, all I can remember is just walking around with, you know, like a, a child in a candy shop almost. Um, and I think that is really what provides that ultra connection, I, I feel, with that tournament. Um, and I think, of course, you know, playing there, there is nothing like it and I absolutely adore it. But um if I if I were to refer to memories, it's probably walking around with strawberries and cream in my hands, and and you know, look, watching the, the big courts and and you know maybe visualising myself on there at some at some stage in the future. I was going to ask you about the strawberries and cream. I think that's always the two things that pop into people's mind when I ask them about Wimbledon. What is the one thing? And they give me two things. And they say it's always about. The strawberry, strawberries and cream and maybe a glass of, of pims on the side i was just about to say you my hands, they definitely say the pims yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah very much so very much so i mean the news that the wimbledon wasn't going to happen this year because of the the coronavirus pandemic what were your thoughts around that but i mean uh, obviously i i'm i'm disappointed the, the way that this year's unraveled so far because I was looking forward to this year. I felt confident going into it, and and I, was, I came off the back of it's a basically maybe five months off because of a few niggles and injuries that needed to settle down. Um, but I was excited about this year. I felt like I built up well, and I was prepared to really do some damage. So, to me, um, I think this this grass season I, I was generally probably probably the one that I was looking forward to most. Um, but I do appreciate that there are some bigger things in, in, in the world right now that need to be uh, addressed. And there's, you know, I can't feel like a victim right now. And I don't think and anyone that does feel like a victim has got the wrong mentality. Absolutely. Uh, well said. In terms of just, I just want to go back to Spain very quickly, because obviously in Spain is mainly clay courts. Mm -hmm. um, do you get the chance to, because obviously the grass season is quite short. So which two, which out of the two do you prefer playing on the clay or the grass? I probably prefer playing on grass. I mean, if you ask any of the um, my fellow British players, they'd probably refer to me as the clay court player in 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 GB. But I, I actually do. You're Kiki Burton's. You're going to be like Kiki Burton's, like yeah. a yeah. specialist of clay. Yeah, I mean, listen, my I, I'm thankful that I built a game that um, is can adapt to all all courts, and and that's something that gives me confidence as well because I. I don't feel weaker on one court or the other. Um, I think sometimes, you know, with the with the Brits, that they've been unfortunate with the fact they haven't had that exposure on the clay court. So sometimes the clay court season is basically written out of their calendars. And and I respect Jo Conta a hell of a lot for what she's done. And you know, she's she's applied herself so much to learn how do I play on this surface and how do I really put you know put my mark on the game on this surface that I've not spent much time on. Um, and, and she's done phenomenally well with that. And I think that's the same for me. I, I, I enjoy playing more surfaces. Of course, grass season gets the edge, but I, I'm not sure whether that's because of the surface or just the atmosphere of being, you know, those tournaments are so, uh, so exhilarating for British players that maybe my perspective or my point of view on them is slightly biased because, you know, I'm, I've got people you know, cheering my name and things like that. And that makes a massive difference. And in terms of the women's game, how is it, how exciting has it to be to see different winners at the Grand Slams over the last few months? Yeah, I mean the women's game. Um, it's it's funny. I think I've had this question a few times recently, and, and and my stance doesn't change. If Serena Williams weren't present in tennis, which you know I would never want to be the case, but if she weren't present in tennis over the last fifteen years, I I, I think we would have seen something similar. Um, 
that dominance that we saw from from her is 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 unique and it's it's just original and it's probably not going to be seen again. Um, and I think you know because we've had Serena, we haven't really managed to see the other players in the game you know take over and 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 win some titles. And as as she um you know edges towards the end of her career, I think people are actually seeing what what the women's game really is and. and you know, it's nowhere near as consistent as, as the men's game in terms of, you know, this top 10, bar the top four, which are the obvious ones, even the top 10 tend to be the similar similar um, players with women. You know, we are probably more, well, we're definitely more inconsistent. And, and I think now the, the public are, are seeing that more, whereas I think as players, it's something that's not necessarily new to us. Finally, Fran, if I was to ask three of your friends, how would they describe you in one word? What do you think they would choose? <laughs> God. Uh, straightforward or direct, probably. Okay. I put determined in there as well. I yeah. Think. Yeah, ambitious. Maybe. Yeah. yeah it, depends, maybe. it depends if I'm, if I'm next to them when you ask them or not. <laughs> <laughs> um... But yeah, I, I don't know, probably one of those two, yeah. Well, Fran, thank you so much for your time. I'm just going to quote your motto, because I think this is fantastic. Your life motto is, I have to read this, greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. Cannot do, yeah, I think that, that is my motto. Yeah, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Fran, thank you so much for your time. All the best for the future. And look forward to seeing you on the court fairly soon. Yeah, thank you very much.